So without any uh, other comments, I would say uh, welcome to Betsy and uh, Rose. We are uh, glad you are able to be with us today, and we do look forward to learning uh, about the reality of uh, human trafficking, and uh, especially here in Northwest Pennsylvania. So welcome. Thank you. Are we ready to go? Ready. Uh, I believe we are. Okay. All righty, Rose, I'll get started and then I'll have you um, introduce yourself when I'm done introducing myself and then we'll go into the program. So initially, let me get the screen shared. Let's make sure this is, nope, that's not what I wanted, sorry. Can you see, I, I'm not seeing it. So can you see understanding human trafficking? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's hope that I did this right. I'm not real good at this, but we'll it, give it a try. It looks good here, Betsy. Okay. Um, my name is Betsy Wiest. I'm the social justice coordinator for the Sisters of St. Joseph. Um, I have been the social justice coordinator for about four and a half years now. The Sisters of St. Joseph of Northwestern Pennsylvania have been fighting human trafficking since the year 2000. Um, and so our, our purpose today is to bring an awareness of this subject to you, not so that you can just know about it, so, but so that you can take this information and you can have this conversation with others and spread the awareness. Rose, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Rose Hilliard. I'm the Medical Advocate at Women's Services. I've been there over 19 years. And many years, I worked as the family advocate and ran across different situations that didn't quite look like domestic violence or sexual assault. So in 2015, we created the Crawford County Human Trafficking Task Force, and we've been going strong ever since. Um, I also am a part-time Commission lay pastor for the Presbyterian faith. So I take this into my faith as I move forward, always keeping my eyes and ears open. Um, just a trauma reminder that this is a, a pretty tense and rough subject. So if you feel like you need to step back and take a breath or close your window for a while and breathe, that is fine. Because as I said, this can bring some trauma reminders to you. Thank you. Thanks, Rose. Okay, let's dive into our subject matter today. All right, Jeff, my, I am not able to, I'm gonna stop the share because I'm not able to, to get my PowerPoint to work. So let me try it one more time and see if this, Okay, Jeff, do you have my PowerPoint up? Uh, let me check if I'll have it up in a minute. Okay, yeah, I, I'm not able to move the, the, the slides. So if you could do that for me, I would truly appreciate it. In the meantime, I'm gonna kind of get started while Jeff is doing that. Uh, so we don't waste any time. Human trafficking is technically the recruitment, the harboring, the transportation or provision of obtaining a person. You're right, they're actually buying a person. Bottom line is human trafficking is a really nice way to say slavery. And in this country, slavery was outlawed in 1863, but it still happens here today. Um, again, human trafficking is the recruitment the harboring, the transportation provision, or obtaining of a person for a commercial sex act or labor services through force, fraud, and coercion. And in order to be human trafficking, all three of those elements have to be there, force, fraud, and coercion. The only exception uh, to that is when there's a minor involved. If there's a minor involved, you do not have to prove all of that, uh, obviously, because you want to um, you want to protect the minor. I'm on slide two. Thank you very much. And go ahead and give me the whole slide. Thank you. So let's go on to the next slide. Let's explain what this means. So the first thing is force. Um, force is a way to to pull somebody in and they, and they do this forcefully. Oops, go back, you have, to, you have to hang on to that slide. That's the one that moves really quickly. Um, and this can be through physical assault, it can be through restraint, it can be through confinement, but more often than not, the force that's used 
is addiction, whether it's drug addiction, whether it's a mental addiction, whether it's some sort of a psychological bond, that really is the force that's used. I know we've all seen that movie, was it Taken, where they, you know, they, they take somebody and they, they tie this, this person up. More often than not, victims know and trust the person who is trafficking them because that person has groomed them. And we'll get into that a little bit. Um, and there's this psychological bond. They are, um, they are brought into human trafficking through fraud. Now this is a deception or offers of employment, of marriage, of a better life. Um, this happens a lot with young girls. Oh, wouldn't you like to be a model? You're so beautiful. I can help you be a model. That's not really the case, that they're not going into modeling. Um, we're finding right now with COVID, um, fraud is often employment deception. It's um, everybody's out, many people are out of work. And so people are saying, well, I can give you a job. The job isn't quite what you thought it was gonna be. So force, fraud, and coercion. And again, this is an abuse of power. Maybe it's debt bondage. Maybe um, someone has come into this country and the trafficker has said, well, I paid to get you into this country. So now you owe me that. Uh, withholding documents. Many people who come into this country who are illegal or who are, uh, and not even illegal, but just don't understand what our laws are. They hand over their documents. And so you've got somebody who was holding their passport, holding their driver's license, holding their documentation, threats to family. You'll do this or I will kill your dog. I will hurt your family. I will do other things. And I'm gonna share with you later a real life story about blackmail. So we'll get into that later. I won't take the time now, but you gotta have all three of these. Is trafficking and smuggling the same thing? No, it is not. A smuggler allows illegal entry into a country for a fee, but on arrival here, that smuggled person, they, they've paid their money and they're free to go. A trafficking victim is enslaved. And the other thing that you need to understand is that trafficking does not require that you cross country borders. It doesn't require that you cross state borders. It doesn't require that you cross county borders. It doesn't require that you cross the street. Trafficking can happen within the building that you're in. If I were to say, and Rose, I'm gonna use you as an example if that's okay. Mm -hmm. If yes. I were to say to Rose, you're gonna go into the room down the hall and you're going to do whatever it is I've told you to do. You don't wanna do it. And I'm going to benefit from it and she is not. That's trafficking and it happened right in the same building where we both are. So understand, the difference between trafficking and smuggling and understand that trafficking doesn't have to be a physical movement of a person. Again, it is the idea that somebody is being forced to do something that they don't want to do and they are not getting a benefit from that. Let's move to the next slide, Jeff. After drugs, human trafficking, it's, it's actually this slide, I need to update it. It is no longer tied with arms dealing as the second most profitable criminal industry in the world. It is the fastest growing after drugs um, and, it, and it is the second most profitable industry in the world. They're estimating that it's an estimated annual revenue of about $150 billion and rising per year. Out of that $150 billion, the estimate is that roughly 100 billion of that is in the sex trade. And out of that 100 billion, what we're estimating now is roughly a third of that is happening in this country alone. About 33, 34 billion dollars in sex trade in this country. Next slide, please. So how many slaves are there? Right now, it's estimated that there's roughly 20 to 30 million slaves in the world today. 20 to 30 million, I want you to wrap your head around that. That's a lot of people and that's worldwide. The majority um, of, of females, as you can see from the graph, are involved in sex exploitation. There's a, it's not quite so even a split, but it's a 60-40 split for males, for females, for labor exploitation. And this is worldwide. So as I said, victims can be trafficked into the US from anywhere. Next slide, please. 
However, and this is a statistic that I always found to be very, very disturbing because when we think of trafficking, we think of people who are coming into this country. However, roughly 83% of sex trafficking victims in the US are US citizens. The average age to enter the life is anywhere between 11 and 13. Think about this, an 11 year old kid is lured into trafficking and we're gonna tell you how that happens, but it does. But 83% of, of the victims, the, the biggest high risk group by far are kids who are coming out of the foster care system. They age out at the age of 18. The supports that they had all through foster care are suddenly no longer there and they're very vulnerable. And what we find are the traffickers or the pimps, and let's call them what they are, they're pimps. Um, they tend to zero in on somebody's vulnerability big time. They find what that vulnerability is. They fill that need. That person then somehow feels that they are beholden to that pimp and they will do whatever they say. I know of a case in Pittsburgh where the FBI found a young lady. She was living under the bridge, under a bridge in Pittsburgh and the FBI found her and it took over a year of questioning her and working with her until she understood what was happening to her, but she didn't want to turn her pimp in because he had bought her a pair of Ugg boots and nobody had ever bought her a pair of Ugg boots. You got to understand that these young people, and you and I sit there and think, Ugg boots, boots, are you kidding me? But understand where these kids are coming from. They're 11, 12, 13, 14 years old. Developmentally, they do not have the ability to fight somebody who is using the tactics that the pimps are using. Developmentally, they're just not mature enough to understand this. That's how they get sucked in. So let's talk a little bit about pimps. So Jeff, could we have the next slide, please? The pimp lifestyle has been glamorized. And a pimp is actually, if you break it out, P-I-M-P, -P, it's a person in a management profession. However, it has been glamorized in the media, in video games, in movies and songs. I've given you some things here that, that show you. Um, the one that just absolutely turns my stomach is Snoop Dogg, who apparently is a rapper. He brought two women on dog leashes to the 2003 MTV Music Awards. And he was America's most lovable pimp, according to Rolling Stone. And we all thought that was great. That was great. And it isn't. Um, he, he bragged about, I've got a bitch on every exit in LA. Because you see, pimps don't look at the people they're trafficking as people. They're a product, just like a drug is a product. So they call them bitches because that demoralizes, it dehumanizes, it makes it easier for them to be able to sell them. There's a yearly players ball where all the pimps get together and they celebrate one another. Just turns my stomach. Um, the Academy Awards honored the song, It's Hard Out Here for a Pimp. It won the Oscar for the best original song for the movie Hustle and Flow. Grand Theft Auto is the number four best-selling video game of all time. And that's where in the, in the course of that game, the player is asked to pick up a prostitute, have sex with them, kill them, and then they get their money back. That's how they get their points. We've glamorized this. We have made it seem okay. We've desensitized it. So therefore, we are no longer shocked by pimp or what they're doing. Next slide, please. The whole purpose of our presentation today is to have you leave with this thought. The eye doesn't see what the mind doesn't know. So if you don't know it here, you can't see it here. And if you can't see it here, you don't know what you're looking for and you don't know what to do when you find it. So remember that phrase, the eye doesn't see what the mind doesn't know. Today, we want your mind to know so your eye can see and so your mouth can open and it can make that call to help somebody. It can have that conversation and this is not a comfortable conversation but you need to have the conversation with other people who are not in this presentation so that they can learn too. It's important that we spread, because I'm gonna tell you one thing, the pimps, they're all talking, they're working together. 
if we don't work together and if we don't bring awareness to them, then they win. And that's not what we want. And then we have more young people trapped in slavery. At this point in the presentation, I'm going to turn it over to Rose for a while. I'll be back with more information later. Rose, you're up. Thank you, Betsy. So what contributes to trafficking? Look at this list here. Something stick out for you? For me, supply and demand. Supply and demand, a human being. It comes down to economics. Now you compare that to drugs and arms, sold once and a person is sold over and over. Ownership of a person is, can be transferred, just like a car, transfer it. And the, and the difference, when you look at the selling drugs and, and selling a car or selling people, this is just a big, big moneymaker. Um, others that are not shown here on this slide, and if you're looking at that slide and picking out things, that's a lot. But some of the things not shown in the rural ways of human trafficking are people selling people so they can pay rent and possibly buying drugs, paying utility or clothing. What it always comes back to is money. And to think that this is happening just in our community. Next slide. Let's start out with labor trafficking. So force, fraud and coercion. There's those words again, keep them, keep them in your mind. They use these three, force, fraud or coercion, and they recruit, harbor, transport, obtain or employ a person for labor or work, services in involuntary servitude, debt bondage or slavery. And you look, they can be found agricultural, landscaping, construction, manufacturing, as well as domestic situations. Um, a nanny, a nanny that may have to work 23 hours a day and doesn't get to rest, as well as in sweatshops and on construction sites. And it's more economic to pay people less than minimum wage. It's a lot cheaper and they can, you can work them harder. Especially when you think about if they're brought into the, com the country and they are not used to our wage laws. If you're brought in from another country, would you know the wages or would you know the labor laws? How would you? You would only know what you've been told. So in these situations in labor trafficking, they don't know what the wage should be. All they know is they're trying to pay a debt that they don't actually owe. Next slide. Sex trafficking a commercial sex act induced by, there's these words again, force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person is performing the act is a minor. Victims can be found in massage parlors, uh, brothels, strip clubs, maybe some escort services, and especially on the internet. So keep these words again in your mind. Think about the grooming of our children, our young adults, and sometimes, Ready for this? The elderly are groomed to be brought into sex trafficking. So what, let me tell you a little bit about grooming. And grooming can be targeting a victim. And oftentimes traffickers target victims who have noticeable vulnerabilities, maybe emotional neediness and low self-esteem and very much economic stress. They gain their trust, get their information, and gathering information about that person is definitely a key way of keeping that person. So think about them filling a need for that person that, that hasn't had what they needed. Talked about the Ugg boots. Isolation, a big thing. Maybe some abuse along with that as they begin to maintain control. And the big venue, again, social media. It's easy because the information is out there. I think about all the kids that are on Instagram and things like that, putting information out there. Well, actually even young adults, even us, sometimes we put our information out there. So it's easy for a trafficker to gain that information. Next slide. So commercial sex act, any act on account of which anything of value is given 
were received by a person. The criminal industry has preyed on the vulnerable. The commercial sex industry preys on women, children, young boys who are vulnerable. Sex trafficking is a criminal industry and it operates on the market principles of supply and demand. The demand is created by the buyers who pay for commercial sex. And that ensues that the sex trafficking continues to exist. Next slide. So how are victims trafficked and held? There's force, as you see here, the rapes, beatings, constraints, addiction to drug and alcohol, fraud, false and deceptive offers of employment, marriage, better life. In my time as family advocate in our shelter, um, the one, one of my first victims was, had found her husband on eHarmony came from another country, moved to um, the central PA, and he married her because it was love. Well, then he trafficked her out. So this does happen. When you look at the um, addiction to drug and alcohol, it's not always that that person was an addict before. The trafficker can get them dependent on drug and alcohol. And so once they're addicted, and they're struggling already, it's tough for them to even try to think about getting out of the situation. When you think about confinement, sometimes it is more psychological than physical. There may be a physical beating, but also emotion, you think about emotional abuse and how it brings you down, the hurt and they tear down their victims to their almost nothing. They take them to a low level of self-esteem then the traffickers then build them up. So they come to depend on the trafficker. Next slide. So who is at risk? I think we've seen some of these before. Number one is foster care, but LGBTQ also is a very, very vulnerable population. Homeless and runaways, definitely. The average age, as Betsy said, 11 to 14 years old. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children estimates at least 100,000 to 300,000 children are at risk every year. 40 to 70% of runaways engage in prostitution, and that's just to meet their basic needs. So for a trafficker to see that, they can take them in and give them the basic needs. One in three are lured into commercial exploitation within the first 48 hours of them living on the street. The traffickers are often waiting. They're just waiting for their next victim. Next slide. Also at risk, vulnerable women and men, immigrants and migrants and refugees. They are at risk when they enter the US and they are unaware of the systems to, pr to protect them, the ones that are in place. You think about, think about your area. If you're from Erie or Crawford or Mercer, do you know all the services in your area? Probably not. So people that are at risk, immigrants, migrants, refugees, they don't know all the things that are in place. What is open to help them out? How would they know that? Traffickers wouldn't talk to them about social services or faith-based anything. And oftentimes they do hold their documents and they tell them if they go to the police that the victim will be arrested and deported. Next slide. American minors. Minors are easy targets for sex victims. You think about the vulnerability of them. You think about the hormonal Things, what's going on at home. I'm thinking at age 14, my son and I, it was a tough time with his hormones raging and us fighting. That's very vulnerable for them. And traffickers target that. And they also target locations that uh, attract youth, like schools and malls, parks and shelters. Traffickers can even be in the schools. 
and definitely on the internet. Oftentimes they use deceptive and personal contact. They may engage as the friendly person or the rescuer. Oh, you look like you're having a bad day. Did you have a fight with your mom? Maybe we can go get some coffee and spend some time together. Or it could be a flirty, flirty situation, either on social media or off. When I was going to seventh grade and talking with the seventh grade girls, I would say to them, who's on Facebook or who's on Instagram? And most of them would raise their hand. And I would say, so you know all your friends? And they'd say, no. So I would tell them, so that good looking guy, handsome, hot guy that you're talking to, you don't know him? No. Well, how do you know that it isn't some 50 year old man or woman on the other side grooming you? So that flirty um, boyfriend, girlfriend thing, we have to be careful on social media, actually anywhere. 46% of the time, the victim may know their recruiter, maybe family, maybe an acquaintance, could be a neighbor. And ready for this statistic? 42% of recruiters are females. A lot of the traffickers have bottom girls that go out and recruit young children to be brought in to their little circle of trafficking. So they can be as a friend, as a girlfriend saying, you need somebody, let's go talk. And as they get to know them, they trust them and they're brought in. And I think Betsy, you're gonna talk about the SOAP program. I am. Jeff, if you'd go back to the um, previous slide, please. Thank you. I want to talk a little bit about how, how this happens. I'm going to give you a, a couple of case scenarios. One happened in Erie. We had our very first um, human trafficking coalition meeting, and I am the co-chair of the um, Anti-Human Trafficking Coalition Force Erie, um, which is run out of the Ridge School of Intelligence at Mercyhurst University. We started in September of 2019. After our first meeting, I get a call from Representative Bizarro's office, his chief of staff, and he said, Betsy, you are not going to believe what happened. I said, no, what happened? And he said, I had a woman who called me after the meeting, and her 11-year-old daughter had been playing World of Minecraft, some video game, it doesn't really matter which one, with somebody who she thought was a 13-year-old boy. And through the course of this video game, she shared how she was unhappy. You know, 11 year old girls, let's face mm -hmm. it, they get a little moody. And so this kid just kind of fed right into that. And he convinced her that her life was awful in her home. And that really what she should do is that she should come and live with his family. So he convinced her to steal money from her parents, which she did. He convinced her to buy a bus ticket, which she did to Connecticut and had her mother not been diligent about looking at her daughter's phone and seeing where she was, this girl would have been on a bus the following Tuesday to meet a 27 year old man in Connecticut. The writing is on the wall as to how that story would have ended. Mom went to the attorney general and they were following it up. That's how easy it happens. But I wanna tell you a story about a woman and her name is Teresa Flores, I've met her. Um, she was about 13 years old. She was the daughter of a, um, a businessman. He, he worked for a company and um, doing a successful ex executive. And as a result, the family moved frequently. So Teresa was always the new kid in the school. Well, when you're 12 and 13 and you're always the new kid in the school, it's really difficult to make friends. So they moved to Detroit. And in the school, there was a senior who would kind of say hi to her in the hall, stop and talk at the locker. And this took a long time. Because um, you know, when you're a pimp, when you're grooming somebody, you have the time. Because the payout at the other end is gonna be so worth the time that you're putting into this right now. So he spent almost a year just kind of helping her feel at ease with him. And then one day he said, hey, would you like a ride home from school? Now think about it. You've talked to this guy all year long. You think everything is fine. How many of us wouldn't say, sure, I'll take a ride home. And on the way home, he says, do you mind if we swing by my house? I just need to pick something up. Not an unreasonable request. They stop at his house and he says, would you like to come in for a Coke? This is a young girl who's desperate for friends, for, desperate for acceptance of some sort. And this really good looking guy says, would you like to come in for a Coke? Yeah, she's gonna come in and have a Coke. 
What she didn't know is that he laced it with something. And two hours later, when she finally woke up and he showed her the pictures of what she had done with some of his friends, she was appalled. And she wanted the pictures and he said, sure, I'll give you the pictures back, but wouldn't it be a, a shame if these pictures made their way to your father's boss? Betty loses job. Now at 13 years old, you're not savvy enough to say to the guy, go ahead, give them to my dad's boss. My dad has my back. You're terrified of your father finding out, your mother finding out, you're embarrassed, you've been victimized, you think it's your fault, although it's not. So she said, what do I have to do? And he had her right then and there. It only took him two hours in, in his house and he's got her. So he would call her at midnight, one o'clock and she would sneak out of her house and he would pick her up and he would take her wherever he wanted to and men paid him to have sex with her. She finally, got out of the life um, when her father moved. It was the only way that she got out. She didn't realize that she had been a, a trafficking victim. She became a counselor. Years later, she went to a continuing ed program on trafficking. And as she sat there and she listened to this program, she realized, oh my gosh, this is me. And then she got mad. So Teresa Flores started what's called the SOAP program. It means saving our adolescents from prostitution. And the, the whole purpose of this program is to bring awareness, but it's to reach the victims. So they take little individual sized bars of soap with labels on them that have a couple of questions. Are you being forced to do something that you don't want to do? Do you really want to be here? And then it gives them the number for the human trafficking hotline. If you want help, call this number. And they place those soaps in the bathrooms of hotels. They put them in restaurants, in, in the restrooms, bus stations, airports, anywhere where a victim might possibly be. And those soaps have helped hundreds and hundreds of victims get out of the life. But it all, it was all because somebody said, hey, can I give you a ride home? It's just that easy. Go ahead, Rose, thank you. Next slide. So we're going to talk a little bit about the city versus the rural because what we can see in the rural can be very different. Now we've talked about the foster care, the LGBTQ, homeless and runaways, disabled can also be victimized, intellectually disabled, medical and substance use, sexually abused, and involvement with the welfare system. So when we look at the city here, this is what you see, the visible victims. Sometimes you can see visible pimps on the streets, maybe meeting at cars, gangs, runaway, always social media. But the rural can be also a bit different. You have the mail order brides, internet dating site. Backpage is no more, um, but we have hundreds of new sites that they can get on. And then you have the runaways. Family dysfunction, and that's what I have really seen um, around here. Rural areas allow for less intervention when the home and those residing in the communities are spread apart through the landscape and geographical areas, because rural areas are definitely different. When distance gets in the way and your neighbor's not very close, it is hard for victims to find shelter somewhere. And if a traffic victim tries to they decide to run away from the trafficker or from a risky situation, it could be miles before they reach safety or the closest residency. Even with a running start, it's likely that the trafficker will be able to locate them or have a pretty good idea of where they're headed. So imagine trying to come forward as a victim if you're in a small community. The perpetrator maybe just isn't just your trafficker, but maybe it's your classmate's uncle. And the men who purchased you for sex aren't just abusers, but also your neighbors. When the community is tight-knit and everybody knows each other, a trafficking situation can involve familiar faces. And that's even more scary for a victim. And with social me media, it is much easier for the traffickers to sell their merchandise over and over. When coming out as a victim, and having to name someone that your family knows and trying to seek justice, 
that means that your neighbor or your neighbor's uncle or your cousin's uncle or whomever is going to face prison time. Sometimes sympathy only stretches so far. And what can happen is chances are you're not going to be able to be seen as a victim. You'll be seen as a homewrecker. So rural victims, it's very tough for them because it can be family that's trafficking them out. It can be a neighbor. It can be someone that they know. And the, the buyers are people that they know. So for them to find that help in the rural areas, it's a lot harder also. Next slide. So some signs that you may be looking for can be the changes in behavior or lifestyle, older boyfriend or girlfriend or tattoo. Think about behavior changes all of a sudden in someone or changes in routine. Um, more secretive, maybe missing school or working long hours or isolation. You also can see depression, hopelessness, guilt and shame, maybe some flashbacks or nightmares. Lots, loss of confidence, lower self-esteem, anxiety can be a common feeling of a trafficker and survivor. PTSD, stress disorders, substance abuse, and possibly the talk of suicide. Some of the other things could be the lifestyle changes. Um, suddenly has maybe some name brand clothing or designer purses, manicures, hairstyling, new material things that maybe they couldn't afford before. They may have a boyfriend or a girlfriend that seem, they, so they feel they have to be careful on what they say or what they're doing. They're being, maybe being controlled by this boyfriend or this girlfriend. Tattoos. Um, a couple of the victims I have seen have uh, barcode tattoos across their neck. Some of them have them on their arm, little barcodes, so they know that they belong to. Or they even have a tattoo that says, I belong to. Um, you can see all, all these things. Um, as a medical advocate, I have seen quite a few of these and that is in our area. Next slide. Human trafficking and our favorite COVID-19. So we could have an increase in third party reporting in Erie. I mean, the numbers have definitely gone up. We may have a decrease in self or child reporting, mandate reporting. Victims don't wanna self identify right now. And abuse, I, working in the domestic violence field itself, abuse has risen and physical abuse is more severe, but people don't want to come out because of the scare of COVID. Go ahead, Betsy, if you want to take the last. Yes, um, I had a conversation with Sister Ann Victory, who is on the board of directors for the U.S. Catholic Sisters Against Human Trafficking. And I asked her, I said, what is your organization seeing right now? She said, right now in COVID, they're seeing a huge increase in virtual sex trafficking and grooming. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of grooming going on and there's a lot of trafficking. The traffickers are, Coercing, coercing children to, to send nude photographs, photographs of them doing sexual acts. And those photographs are being sold over and over and over again. When the travel restrictions are lifted, we are going to see a lot of movement of people. Right now, what we're seeing is a lot of recruitment through the internet, which is why I'm gonna just say this over and over and over again. It is imperative that you know what websites your kids are on, you monitor their devices. If you can put parental controls and locks on, watch the websites, watch for things like Snapchat, TikTok. These are things where you can post something, it goes away. Nothing ever goes away on the internet. It is out there forever. The other thing to think about, and, and sister said to me, is that in many cases right now, kids aren't in school. So teachers have always been that first line mm -hmm. of, they kind of notice that something is wrong and they're not there. So kids are being groomed and trafficked and the teachers aren't catching it, not because they don't want to, but because they're not laying eyes on the kids. One thing to bear in mind is polarisproject.org just recently completed a 10 year study of um, um, 
interviewing survivors, victim survivors. And victims don't always like to be called victims. Many of them like to be called survivors. So I use the terms kind of interchangeably out of respect for those who have undergone this horrific crime. But they've identified 25 different business plans, bona fide business plans on how to buy and sell a human. There are books on the internet on how to buy and sell a human. Please do not buy these books because the profit goes back to the pimp and we don't really need to, to go there. Just know that there are 25 different business plans that have been identified through all sectors. Trafficking victims, you know, when you think about it, I want you to think about this for a minute. Back in 1863, let's, let's go back a couple hundred years ago. If you walked into the town square, you'd probably know who the slaves were. Let's, be, let's, let's call it what it is. They were probably in chains. That isn't the case today. A slave can be the person who is behind you in the line at Walmart and you don't see it because you don't know what you're looking for. So that's something to, be, to, to think about. And who buys kids? I'm gonna tell you, the research is showing right now that most people who buy kids are white middle-class guys who are buying somebody the same age as a child they have at home. Um, this, is, this is a very sick, sick crime, and it is one that we have to continue to bring awareness about. Next slide, please. Jeff, next slide. Thank you. This is the Polaris statistic map from 2017. They haven't updated it since then. But you're going to see the orange dots are the areas, whoops, go back. The orange dots are the areas where trafficking is the most prevalent. And you're going to see that it's really on the two coasts. Now, it does go from, from sea to shining sea. But look at our area. Look at how orange we are. That, that's huge. Now, if you go to the next slide, I'll explain why that happens. The reason that this area is so incredibly fraught with human trafficking is because we're a transportation hub. If you look at the map, you're going to see I-90 and I-79 intersect. And we're just about an hour or so from Erie from I-80. Now, I want you to think about something. Trafficking is the second largest money maker under drugs. This, these are the drug routes. The drug routes go to sell drugs. They go from Buffalo to Cleveland, to Pittsburgh, to Philly, to Detroit, to Toledo, which is a hotbed of trafficking, but everything goes through Erie and in, in that area, which is why there is so much trafficking here. And you're gonna say, yeah, but I'm not seeing it. Of course you're not seeing it because people are bought and sold from the comfort of your living room. They're not standing on a street corner with a sign that says, hey, I'm for sale. They're being bought and paid for online. And what happens is as the drugs move, so do the people. So you have, um, you have people who are bringing people here, selling them over and over and over. And when I say they're selling somebody, it isn't one time a night. A victim survivor can be raped and that's exactly what it is. They can be raped 10, 15 times in a night every night, seven nights a week. Um, and, and I know that's hard to hear, but that's the reality. And you have to know what the reality is. That's it. And then they move them on. So every year, and I've met with the FBI about this, every year the FBI, they put together an annual sting. And it's a nationwide thing where they really try to zero in on the traffickers. But what makes it so different, difficult is that the traffickers, the pimps are constantly on the move. Mm -hmm. So by the time the FBI figures out where they are, they're already gone. That's what makes it hard. So let's go to the next slide, please. Um, I travel a lot in Pennsylvania. I have kids in the Harrisburg area. And so we go there a lot. And I stopped at the rest stop because I always have to stop at a rest stop. Go back, please. And this is the sign that's in the current rest stops. If you look at that sign and you're a, a survivor or if you're somebody who knows nothing about trafficking, what does that tell you? Absolutely nothing. And that number, by the way, 888-3737-888, that is the National Trafficking, Human Trafficking Hotline. That takes you to polarisproject.org and they would connect you with the resource person or organization in your, in your area. Well, you know, as I'd stop at rest stops, I'd look at that and I think this is just so wrong. This is just not the right thing to do. 
So I started visiting. Actually, what I started doing was I had my husband, God bless his cotton socks, stop at every single rest stop all the way from our house to my kids near Harrisburg. And I noted exactly where the sign was in each rest stop because I made him go in the men's room and look. And I went in the ladies' room and I said, and I wanted to know which rest stops had them, which didn't, and I documented it. Then I got my friends, the Lutheran women on board. And I said, ladies, when you're traveling around, this is the information I need. And they provided me with all kinds of information and I put it in graph form. And then I started making visits to the senators, the representatives, state and also, also national. And I said, you know, this sign is not in every rest stop and it should be. Not only that, this sign is totally ineffective and we need to change it. Next slide, please. This is the sign that I have proposed. This tells you what human trafficking is. Kids who are in the life are not going to read it. Go back, please. But they are gonna look at the pictures because uh -huh. kids today look at pictures. This is the sign I'm proposing. Currently in Pennsylvania, there is House Bill 644 and Senate Bill 972. They are mirror bills. One is coming up through the House, one is coming up through the Senate. And the idea of this bill is to make the sign in the rest stops something like this, but more importantly, I want the signs placed differently. I want the signs placed in every stall because when a victim survivor goes into the rest stop, in that stall is the only time that person is gonna have alone where they can read the sign. Because I can guarantee you when a, when a pimp takes a victim into the rest stop, they're not saying, oh, see that sign? That pertains to you, you should read that. No, they're gonna skirt right by. So I had one legislator say, who said to me, well, if we do that, it would take a lot of paper. And my response was, you mean to tell me that a pallet of paper is worth more than a person's life? I think we need to get on this. So any chance you get, contact your state legislators and ask them to support House Bill 644 and Senate Bill 972. They're currently in committee, but we need to get them out of committee and onto the floor for a vote. That's really, really important to do. Rose, back to you. Next slide. <clears throat> this is the number again of the trafficking hotline. As you can see, it's arranged a little different. And this will help you determine if you've encountered a victim of human trafficking. So maybe give you some community resources. Do not, do not try to rescue a trafficking victim. Do not. If you suspect trafficking and you're right there and it's happening, call 911. The trafficking hotline is great, but sometimes when you get on it, my last trafficking victim who was out of their situation, it still took 45 minutes before we got to talk to someone. So call 911 right away. You can still call the trafficking hotline. You can call Women's Services, the Crime Victim Center, but 911 first. And do not, again, do not try to rescue. If you see something suspicious, call. You could be helping to put a story together. I, I worked with a victim. Um, she had, was in a hotel in Meadville and there had been three or four different calls from different people. Each person had a piece of the story. They didn't know the whole story, but every person they called put together a piece of that story. She ended up at our um, Meadville Medical Center Hospital and got the help she needed. We got her to a safe place. But again, don't try to rescue, call the authorities. Next slide. And this gives you some of the numbers, some of the people that are involved, Women's Services, Amoeba Medical Center, uh, Lindsay's is a shelter, the Crime Victim Center in Erie, they are amazing. Shared Hope has great information. Project Polaris, polarisproject.org. Look up stats, look up signs, look up information. Take some time to do this. It's fresh in your minds right now, so it'd be a good time. Um, you can also talk to the National Human Trafficking Hotline, or you can even text them. So there you have it. Another thing to remember is if you suspect, you truly suspect that there's a, a, a trafficking situation going on, make the call. 
Mm -hmm. Don't say, should I, should I not? I want you to think about something. And this is something that, that a trafficking victim said to me. One minute in my life as a victim, as a slave, is like a thousand years for you. You know, she said, it, it's, it just, it's forever and ever and ever. So when you wait, that person is living this agonizing life. And if you're wrong, well, gee, I'm really sorry. I've inconvenienced somebody. But if you're right, you save a life. That's the big key. If you're right, you save a life. If you're wrong, well, hey, all right. So I wasted somebody's time. Not a big deal. And remember, you can't see what you don't know. The eye doesn't see what the mind doesn't know. Make sure your mind knows, make mm -hmm. sure your eye sees, and then open your mouth and have the conversations. And thank you so much for listening today. Um, if there's any questions, we would be very happy to address them now. We just had a question come in um, that says, do you work with the white um, umbrella campaign? No. I've not heard of that. Rose, have you? I have not. I've worked with the blue campaign, but I have not heard of the white umbrella. Hmm. I am going to look that up. Now, the blue campaign, for those of you who don't know, it's through the Department of Homeland Security. Um, mm -hmm. January 11th is the national day set aside to recognize human trafficking. So January 11th, they encourage everybody to wear blue and then tell people why you're wearing blue. And you're wearing blue in support of the victims and in, in um, support of trying to bring awareness to trafficking. Yeah. They had the blue campaign. We've had the red sand campaign where you put sand in the sidewalks. In, well, you can do it anytime, but January is Trafficking Awareness Month. So we put it in the sidewalks and people ask questions and get information. So white umbrella, I will look that up. Any other questions? Rory, I think that's all the questions we had in or in the in the chat. Um, you can take a couple minutes if uh, anybody else has a question to put one in the, in the chat. Um, I, I'll just say that you know when I when I first started uh, looking into this, I I really didn't expect much of a, a, a wasn't something I thought was important here. And uh, the first phone call that I made was somebody that I know well that works in Crawford County. And her first comment was, you will not believe how prevalent this is in Northwest mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. And that, that shocked me. And, and so I, I, I began and I, I just became aware of the White Umbrella King in a book that I was reading this morning, actually. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure it was in The Pursuit of Love. Um, which is which is a book about a victim, and and, and <clears throat> a number of organizations out there. Um, I, I know we have somebody today from Shared Hope International. One of their reps is is, is on. Uh, they they uh, allowed us to use the the videos from Chosen uh, as we were promoting today, and uh, it's it's another organization that that I've found that provides some great resources, so. We just had another question come in that said, can you elaborate on more red flags that we should look for? Well, I can do some of that. So some signs, and I'm gonna talk, this will be more rural. Um, claims of just visiting are maybe an inability to clarify exactly where they're staying because they've been moved around. Um, a lost sense of time, and inconsist inconsistencies of stories. And I've talked about the fearful, anxious, depressed, submissive, tense, or nervous. Um, maybe avoids eye contact. One thing I have noticed in my line of work, it, that person has few or no personal possessions on them. Um, not con in control of their money. And that's for sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Don't have their papers of identification. No ID, no passport, and coming into the hospital, a lot of times that they are not allowed to speak for themselves. Um, we've worked out with the hospital ways we can do that now, but at first, you know, uh, you have a patient in the room and you're saying, are you safe? And what can they say is, yeah, because the trafficker was there. Um, 
working long or unusual hours, no breaks, a large debt to pay. Does that help at all? Um, we've, we got another question. If, if, that, uh, if you have more um, follow-up questions to that answer that Rose just gave, just let me know. Um, oh, she says, thanks, Rose. Um, we had two more questions come in. The first one is, how do we tell the difference between someone being trafficked and someone simply being abused? I know we need to report all, but what are some differences? I'll tell you right now, abuse and trafficking go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing that goes hand in hand is where there's drugs, there's trafficking. And where there's trafficking, there's drugs. Um, many times, yes, it can be, I don't want to say just abuse. But if you are at all concerned, make the call. Because think about somebody who's living in an abusive situation. Their minutes are like hours too. So, you know, if you see that, just make the call. It's not for you at that point to determine what it is. The professionals will come in and determine what it is. But help that person. Make that call. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question is, I had heard that PA and Ohio are the top U.S. states for sex trafficking. Is this accurate? Huh. in your knowledge. <laughs> I know at one point in time we were, uh, it was it was about 10 at one point in time. I don't know if it still is. That has been a few years. So we were up there. We were, I don't recall us being number one or number two. And Ohio also, I'm not sure about. But just remember, think about, think about the map that we showed you. Think about mm -hmm. the intersection of major highways. Um, anywhere where you're going to have intersections of major highways like that, you're, you're going to find trafficking. There was a question I saw in the chat about Route 6. I can't answer whether Route 6 is, is, a, um, is a, it's a huge trafficking road or not. But anywhere where you're moving drugs, you're moving people. It, it's just that simple. Um, someone else just shared a little experience that they had and, and asking what they should have done. Um, she says uh, she stopped at a rest area once and there were several women who came into the restroom with a woman who seemed to be in charge and then they got on a bus. It sent up some red flags, but I didn't know what to do. What should I have done? Get the license plate number of the bus and call 911. Yes. And if, if you, you know, if you're out some places, again, as Rose said, you never, ever, ever want to intervene. Get the license plate of the car, a description of the person, and call it in. And even now, if they wanted to call it into the trafficking hotline and process with someone, they could do that. Mm. That would be okay. You may have a little bit of a wait, but it might be worth talking about. And you know, the trafficking hotline, Rose, as you brought up a really good point, there was, there was a couple of years ago, there was a trafficking bust in Erie at a massage parlor on Peninsula mm -hmm. Avenue. And that was a direct result of calls that had gone into the trafficking hotline. And again, just Rose, as you had said, everybody called in a little different piece of the puzzle and they were able to put that puzzle together and they found that the, that, that particular bust, it wasn't just that location. Mm -hmm. There were locations from Florida all the way up to Erie but because so many people had called in and said, something just doesn't look right, something just doesn't look right, they were able to put that together and make that bust. So that little piece of information that you think isn't really worth anything might be the piece that they're waiting for. So is it still, I mean, as a follow-up question to that, is it still helpful, even if this happened a year ago, um, is it helpful to call in about that situation now or is it kind of too late? I'd call in anyways. Okay. Mm -hmm. what, what, what do you do? You, you're not, you know, if it doesn't work out, what, you wasted somebody's time? But remember, if it does work out, you saved a life. That's what you got to remember. Right. Um, here is one uh, question or just observation. Um, why don't we have numbers listed boldly everywhere? I couldn't even find numbers to get a young girl out of a situation and had no contact info to get in touch with help. Sadly, she was admitted to several local hospitals before help could be obtained. Why are we making this so difficult? Um, just expressing this person's frustration with wet red tape and um, we need better protocols and intervention. 
and it is frustrating. I agree with that. And I agree with working together in what we do. I'm from Crawford, Betsy's from Erie. I work with Beaver. We need to get the organizations, not just trafficking organizations, but women's services, crime victims, all them organizations working together. There's so much trauma that has happened to our people. And that information should be out there. It would be nice. And it would have been able to help this person in need. We, we don't always know where to turn, but it'd be nice if the hospital, say she went to a hospital, that the hospital would have the numbers. So yes, I, I think we all need to work together. Trafficking is, it's a silent crime. And again, it's not in your face. You're not gonna drive down the street and see people with signs that say, I'm for sale. It doesn't work that way. And, and one way that I often think about it, it's kind of like carbon monoxide in your home. You don't know it's there until it kills you. And trafficking is the same way. It's quiet, it's silent, and you don't see it until it rears its ugly head in some horrific way and then you notice it. I heard something the other day that really stuck out and it was probably at Betsy's meeting. But you think, when we think about pimps, we're, we have a mindset. So we're focused on what we think they look like. But look at Jeffrey Epstein. He didn't look like one. So just keep your eyes open and listen and be aware. Active listening is so important. I haven't received any more questions yet. Um, and uh, someone says, thank you, thank you, thank you for this excellent presentation, both of you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, it's our pleasure to, to yeah. bring this to you. But the big thing is, is we want you to take it from here out there. Mm -hmm. Well, we are, we are a little over an hour and uh, I kind of put this out here, we would be about an hour. So um, I think we'll wrap up there. I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, not only be here today, but the preparation work that you did to, to, to make this happen. And I, I want to just voice again something you said and that is, is that we're, what, the purpose of having this today and doing this is today is that you'll continue to share this story. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm an avid reader and I've probably read a dozen books now and each one I pick up a little bit. And, and one of the things I'm learning is that this is a whole process that goes on. There's a lot more to learn. And um, I wanna thank you for being here. Um, now the rest of us, we need to take it and uh, share it with somebody else. Uh, I was in another conversation the other day on another Zoom meeting and somebody said, I'd never even thought about that. I'll have to look into it. So um, the work is worthwhile, keep it up. Uh, oh. I wanna thank all of you that have come in today. I, I'm, I'm, I have to say, ladies, I wanna tell you, I'm amazed. Mm -hmm. I, I, I come to tons of these and I was monitoring the folks that came in and stayed and almost every person that came in today stayed for the whole presentation. And, and uh, I find that kind of unusual today. So I thank think you. you've captured some hearts and uh, I'd encourage us all to go out. We will make the recording uh, available and uh, have it available for anybody that you wanna share it with. Once again, thanks for being here and uh, be blessed and we will uh, see you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.